Hi, David. Good morning. Good morning. We have two more minutes. I guess we wait a little while. Yeah, no problem. You have any questions while while we wait? Um, I don't think so. Okay. We just wait for the time to come and then we'll start. Is the course uh, easy or difficult or how is it coming along for you? No, it's not too bad. I've found some of the the um like the last couple of lectures to be a bit more to digest, but I've just been reading through the lecture notes and doing the homeworks and it okay. gets better. Yeah, I think the lectures on waveguides are more mathematical and hence yes. harder to digest. I think it's just a lot of a lot to take in at once in a lecture. So it's nice to watch the lecture and then read the notes after. Mm -hmm. I try to make the lecture notes as comprehensive as possible and easy to read so that a lot of the details are actually learned in your homework. So if I put a lot of knowledge to be learned in the lecture notes, the lecture notes will be a lot longer. I only put the essentials in the lecture notes so that if you read the lecture notes, you catch the big ideas. Yeah. Okay. You guys want to show your face so that we add a human touch to our session. Hi, Jian Wong. Thank you for reminding me to send those slides. Okay. Okay, see Jason. What about Jun? Jun? You want to show your, uh, uh, show your face, Jun Chai? Oh yeah, there you are. Everybody's here. How about Chang Kyun Lee? You want to show your face? Because you didn't hear me. Oh, there you are. I see you. So nice seeing you. I guess we should get started. Uh, before we get started, uh, do you have any questions? Today is the day I will give out uh, take home exam two. Okay, and hopefully this afternoon sometime. And today's lecture will be mainly on review. I'll review what we have learned in the last three weeks and you will be tested on those concepts, uh, on those materials. So before I get started, I'd like to share my screen. Okay, you can see my screen, I suppose. So these are the topics that we have learned in the last three weeks or so. And um, so everything is fair game on the take home exam, but it will not be a closed book, it will be an open book, so you don't have to panic. Uh, if you have read the lecture notes in the past few weeks, you should be well prepared for the exam. And you can use the lecture notes as a reference when you do the exam. Or well, some textbooks are also useful. Some of the textbooks that we have in the archive or in the uh, section of the website where we put in a lot of uh, background reading material, you can also use those as a reference. Okay, let's get started. Um, so we would like to review transmission line theory and then transmission line with impedance matching and multi-section transmission line and so on. Um, so the thing about transmission lines is that the theory is relatively simple. We started out by deriving the telegraphers equations, uh, which I would not derive. You can say that the telegraphers equations are the poor man's version of Maxwell's equations because Maxwell's equations are just too complicated to solve. Uh, you want some equations that captures the essence of Maxwell's equations and yet uh, is simple to solve. So we have telegraphers equation that says that dv, dz, 
is minus j omega l i, and then the i dz is minus j omega c v. With l and c are the line impedances. Okay, are the line impedances. Uh, so they are not the usual inductors and the capacitors that you're thinking of, but they're line uh, inductors and line capacitors. So you can think of uh, L delta Z as being the small inductance of the small section of the transmission line and C delta Z as being the small capacitance that you have between the two lines. So having done this, then you have this uh, way of using uh, transmission line to have some wave beha uh, behavior. Okay, so when you have this wave trans uh, traveling on the transmission line, you have two kinds of wave, minus or plus J beta Z, and they go back and forth. One goes to the right, the other one goes to the left. And if you were to terminate this uh, with a impedance, then there would be a gamma reflection coefficient. That reflection coefficient is given by uh, Z n minus one over Z n plus one. Okay, and it also can be written as Z load minus Z zero over Z load plus Z zero, where Z zero is the characteristic impedance and for transmission line is given by square root of L over C. Okay, so this equation is very important. What it says is that once you know the normalized impedance, you would know what the corresponding reflection coefficient is. You can invert this equation, which says that Zn is gamma L uh, is one plus gamma L over one minus gamma L. Okay, so when gamma L is uh, minus one, uh, Z, uh, let me see, when gamma L is equal to one, then you have Z in equals to infinity. Uh, when gamma L is, I'm trying to do some sanity checks on these equations. When gamma L is equal to uh, one, uh, you should have Z N being infinitely large, and then when uh, gamma L is minus one, uh, Zn is, um, I guess, zero, okay? So, so the, the sanity check is that if you have a short at the end of the transmission line, which is this case over here, Zn will be zero, and then you will have uh, gamma L equals minus one. And then when you have a, open circuit, which means that Zn becomes infinity, then gamma L is one. And you can also use this formula to check your sanity of this equation, okay? And so the Smith chart is a way of going back and forth between gamma L and Z, Zn, okay? In order to solve this equation repeatedly in microwave engineering, uh, they have invented a chart that allows you to solve this equation repeatedly using the Smith chart. So given a point uh, Zn on the complex Zn plane, you can find the corresponding point, for instance, uh, over here. Okay, that point will map to that point and they can call this Zn, which is the mapping of a point from the rectangular rectilinear coordinate to the coordinate of the Smith chart. The Smith chart is the coordinate for reflection coefficients. It's a Smith chart for complex reflection coefficient. It allows you to go back and forth. Uh, because of that, then um, you can read off things. Okay, so if you move towards the generator, which is that um, if this is the load, and you assume that you have a generator here. Uh, so this direction is moving towards the generator. 
this direction is moving towards load. Okay, this is towards the generator. You can actually read those things of the edge of the Smith chart, which means that uh, if you were to read this, if I blow this up, you will be able to see that, uh, I guess I don't have a good display setting here. I should say duplicate slideshow. Then it would happen to be better. And you can read it off. The edge of the Smith chart, it says wave uh, length towards generator, which means that you're moving in the decreasing phase direction, which means that you're moving in this direction. And then on the edge, you say uh, wavelength towards load, which means that you know, in the Smith chart, you're moving in the other direction, okay? Let me escape from the, um, yeah, the problem is that without a keyboard, I do not know how to press the escape button. Maybe there's a mouse here. And show, maybe and show, but let me go back to this mode again. Okay, so then you can use this kind of idea to solve multi-section transmission line problems. Uh, we're given a load at the end of a transmission line. You can always calculate the impedance at this junction over here by starting with the load here. Okay, you have the load and then you can move backward and find the impedance there. Okay, and once you know the impedance at this point, uh, you can actually find the corresponding reflection coefficient. And that reflection coefficient would be given by this equation over here. And you have to know which characteristic impedance to pick. So this gamma two, three correspond to you sending a wave on the transmission line three. You have to imagine the wave traveling to the right on transmission line three. And then you will have to use the characteristic impedance of transmission line in this equation. And that will give you gamma two, three. And then once you know the reflection coefficient at this point, you can find the corresponding impedance using this mapping. <coughs> okay, this mapping will let you find the corresponding impedance. And you know that the generalized reflection coefficient in the transmission line is governed by this formula. And you have to learn how to use the correct wave number when you plug in this formula. This wave number has to be the wave number of the corresponding transmission line. So you can move backward. And if you know the impedance here, you can do the same thing and find an impedance here. And once you know the impedance there, okay, which is that if you know Z in two, you can find gamma one, two, and then you can move backward until you find the impedance here. And that allows you to find the reflection coefficient from a multi-junction transmission line. Okay, this is actually uh, what we went through in the detail in the lecture note. That is, if you know the, if you know the, let me see if I can make this bigger, okay. If you know the reflection coefficient at uh, gamma one, two, for instance, if you know the uh, reflection coefficient gamma two, three at this junction, you can find the generalized reflection coefficient at gamma one, two using this formula. This formula is nice in the sense that uh, uh, you need only to know the local reflection coefficient. Local reflection coefficient gamma one, two without the tilde is the reflection coefficient assuming that this line is infinitely long. If, if the line is infinitely long, uh, we call that the local reflection coefficient. And you can plug this in. This has been derived in the lecture notes. So you can also use this to find gamma two, three. If you know ZL here, you can find gamma L three, okay, at that junction. And you can work backward to find the generalized reflection coefficient at each of the junctions. And you can actually use this problem to solve layered medium as well, because a layered medium problem uh, is similar to a transmission line problem. So the next topic that we went to then uh, was actually to study um, reflection by a single interface. 
because we will show that this problem is very similar to the transmission line problem. We have a wave coming in and the wave will get reflected and part of it will get uh, transmitted. And this is homomorphic <clears throat> to this problem that we started out with. We have a wave coming to the right and then the wave is reflected. There actually is a transmitted wave into the load. But when we studied transmission line problems, we did not consider that. But when we study the single interface transmission reflection problem, we allow for the transmitted wave in region two or medium two. Then you can set up Maxwell's equations for this plane wave and mesh boundary conditions uh, requiring tangential E continuous and tangential H continuous at the interface. This is a more elaborate process and it takes a lot of work for you to find those field components. You have to be able to hack the algebra and the vector algebra of Maxwell's equations. So it would be good for you to go through the vector algebra to derive all the field components and then mesh boundary conditions. Uh, it's tedious, but it teaches you something about vector algebra. And you can do the same thing for TM polarization. The previous picture for, is for TE. You can repeat the same thing for TM. But we taught the concept of duality principle, which means that once you have the solutions for TE polarization solved, okay, this is TE. Once you have found a solution for this uh, by the principle of duality, you can find a solution for TM polarization very easily by exploiting the symmetry of Maxwell's equations. Okay, that is called duality principle. And also, once you have solved this problem, you have the concept of phase matching. The concept of phase matching is also introduced and it actually is used a lot in optics. If you're going into the field of optics, phase matching is quite important. It's also called momentum matching because the physicists like to think of um, a momentum of a wave being equal to h bar k, or if you write in the beta notation. Uh, the mo momentum of a photon is h bar k or h bar beta. A beta, the wave number, is related to the momentum of the photon. And hence, uh, when you get the beta components to be equal to each other, uh, they also call that momentum matching. Okay, this is phase matching. Phase matching. I just use the shorthand notation. I'll also call momentum matching in optics. Okay, so the here momentum matching here just means that the x component of beta have to be equal to each other at the interface due to the required boundary condition. So if you draw the beta vectors in all the three regions or, or three of them, they all have to have the same x component in order for phase matching to be satisfied. And then an interesting phenomenon emerges if this medium is uh, optically less dense than this medium, okay? So that happens if uh, beta like uh, beta one is omega squared mu one epsilon one, okay, beta two is omega squared mu two epsilon two. And in the case in this diagram, beta two is beta zero squared. It's air, it's vacuum. Okay. So in vacuum, it often happens that mu one epsilon one is larger than mu naught epsilon naught of vacuum. So if you draw the K vector or the beta vector in the air region, it usually has a smaller length than the K vector in the dielectric region or the glass region, if you can think of this as a glass air interface. And when you draw the phase matching diagram, you will see that as you increase the angle of the incident beta, there will come an instance where beta t becomes horizontal. Okay, that is the case when this theta c is at a critical angle. And if you try to go beyond this angle, beta t becomes imaginary. It becomes an imaginary vector that we cannot draw anymore. Uh, that happens when the wave becomes evanescent in region two, and that is called 
total internal reflection. Okay, we went through those concepts as well. Uh, then uh, we studied total internal reflection in greater detail, and we found that in the TM polarization, it is possible for you to come up with an angle where the reflection coefficient is zero because if you were to reveal your RTM, if I write it down, it will be like, uh, it's not nil, it should be epsilon, epsilon two, uh, beta one Z minus epsilon one, beta two Z over epsilon two, beta one Z plus epsilon one, beta two Z. Okay, and it turns out that in optics, uh, epsilon is often different for different media, whereas mu is often the same. So if I were to write down the corresponding RTE, my duality principle would be mu two uh, beta one Z minus mu one beta two Z over mu two beta one Z plus mu one beta two Z. And mu two is usually mu one is good to mu of air in optics. So the physics of this reflection coefficient is not that interesting in optics. You can never find a value that can set the numerator to zero, but in optics, epsilon two is usually not equal to epsilon one. For instance, for glass, epsilon two is maybe about 2.2. Uh, then these two numbers are quite different and you will find an angle where this can be set to zero and that angle is called the Brewster angle. Okay, that angle is called the Brewster angle. Uh, let me see. Uh, let me see, I can move this down for you to see. The angle is given by this equation. And it turns out that the same angle also exists for making the reflection coefficient going to infinity. So this angle makes the reflection coefficient go to zero uh, when epsilon two and epsilon one are positive numbers. But it turns out that in plasma, epsilon two can be a negative number, for instance. Uh, then you can actually make the denominator go to zero. Uh, you can go through the math when one of this is negative. Uh, you can let this happen such that this reflection coefficient goes to infinity and you end up with the same formula as Brewster angle, but with epsilon two being negative now, okay? When epsilon two be negative, if this is negative, uh, it will make the numerator going to imaginary, that's not good, but it can be negative enough so that both numerator and denominator are negative, making the quantity under square root sign to be positive and beta x will be positive, meaning that you can have a wave propagating in that direction. That is called a surface plus morning uh, plus one polariton, okay? Because reflection coefficient going to infinity means that there's some kind of resonance going on. So this is also called surface plus monic resonance. And it's very much like the resonance of a LC tank circuit. In that case, the impedance goes to infinity, okay? And you can actually look at this mode. This mode is actually evanescent in both directions away from the interface, okay? And then uh, you can actually use transmission line theory to understand the reflection coefficients from multi-layer medium because they are homomorphic to each other. Uh, the equations are very similar for the transmission line. This is a reflection coefficient for the dielectric layers. This is the reflection coefficient. You can map the two problems to each other. And if you know how to find the generalized reflection coefficient for a transmission line, you will also be able to find the generalized reflection coefficient for a layer medium using the concept of what we have learned in transmission line. You will just have to find the generalized reflection coefficient at the two, three interface and so on, and work backward to find the generalized reflection coefficient at the one, two interface. Okay, are there any questions so far? 
Okay, no question, very good. So uh, then we move on to studying dielectric waveguides. Okay, we move on to studying dielectric waveguides where the wave actually bounces back and forth between two layer. And also the resonance condition can also be found easily by setting the reflection coefficient, the generalized reflection coefficient to infinity. If you were to write down the generalized reflection coefficient for this problem, uh, you will send a wave in here and look for the reflected wave. So you go back to this thing, okay? And look for situation where this thing can go to infinity. And that happens when the denominator goes to zero. Reflection coefficient goes to infinity means that you don't need an instant wave and you will have a reflected wave. That is a physical meaning of reflection coefficient going to infinity. And if you were to apply to this geometry where the two reflection coefficients are R1, zero, R1, two, uh, you can arrive at this as your guidance condition that's called a transverse resonance condition. Okay, and when you have total internal reflections at the two interfaces, uh, R1, two, R1, zero and R1, two would have unit amplitude. It would just be something of this form where you can easily show that the amplitude of the reflection coefficient is one, but it will have a phase term, a polar phase term. That phase term is related to the goose tension shift. And you can easily also eyeball this equation and see that this equation can only be satisfied if the magnitude of these two quantities are one. And then there is a phase term coming from this reflection coefficient that will cancel this phase term, making the whole thing equal one uh, on the right-hand side, okay? And this equation is very hard to solve, very hard to solve. It's too transcendental, okay? Too transcendental and implicit it's not a simple equation to solve. So we develop graphical methods to solve that equation. And you manipulate the equation so that you have things like one y1 on the right-hand side, or maybe y2 on the right-hand side, depending on if you're looking at the even or the odd mode. And then on the left-hand side, you have this equation, which is the equation in the circle. So if you have even mode, you have this equation to solve on the right-hand side, and those correspond to plots that looks like this. And if you have odd modes, you look at the right-hand side of that equation, it becomes something like this, okay? So the details are written out in the lecture notes as to how you manipulate the equations into something that looks like this so that uh, the equations are amenable to graphical solutions. Then after having found a technique to solve this problem, you can look at the physics. The physics is rather interesting because we have total internal reflection at the two interfaces. The mode or the wave is purely guided by total internal reflection at these interfaces. So when total internal reflection ceases to occur, then the wave is not bounced back anymore. It gets transmitted and goes to never, never land and never come back. That is when the wave is not guided. Okay. Well, however, when you have total internal reflection, the wave is evanescent outside, strongly evanescent outside, and the field is bounded within the dielectric slab. However, if you get closer and closer to the critical angle, then the wave uh, becomes less and less evanescent. Eventually, it will get transmitted. This will become just flat with the wave leaving the dielectric slab waveguide. So in order for the mode to be guided, uh, you have to have this vertical axis, which is re uh, related to alpha. That number has to be a positive number. If that number is not positive, then the wave is not guided. If it's positive, it means that the wave is evanescent outside. And you can then look for physical interpretations of the results that you have found. You can look at the TE0 mode you'll find that as the frequency gets high, uh, the mode is tightly bound within the dielectric slab and it will have a phase and group velocity approaching that of the dielectric slab. Okay, and that happens for all the modes. 
the modes will get more and more tightly bound. And then, however, if you pick the frequency low enough, if you pick the frequency low enough, uh, which means that if you make the frequency low, this number would become smaller. This is an equation of a circle. And you will find that A will become smaller, which is the radius of the circle. If the frequency is low enough, okay, there will be no more solution with positive alpha. That happens when this circle uh, coincides with this point. If you try to go below that, alpha will become a negative number, which means that you don't have guidance. So you can actually make this circle bigger and smaller, and you will see different kinds of guidance. And at guidance, at cutoff, there's called a cutoff point, where alpha zero x uh, ceases to be a positive number, or the wave ceases to be evanescent outside. Then the wave is just flat. And if the wave is flat outside, it says that all the energy of the mode is outside the slab. Okay. So when the energy of the mode is outside the slab, which is at the cutoff frequency of this mode, it will have group velocity and phase velocity that of the outer medium, is what it says here. And TE0 mode uh, has no cutoff. This is not a nicely drawn picture. It should go smoothly to zero. Just that mode has no cutoff, as you can see. No matter how small you make the circle, it doesn't, the solution, the solution doesn't go away. Okay. Then next, we move to rectangular waveguides. Rectangular waveguides, in a sense, are harder uh, and more complicated than transmission line. And the first waveguide we studied was the dielectric waveguide because it's one dimensional. It only has a wave bouncing back and forth in one dimension rather than two dimensions. Uh, so you can think of wave guidance as plane wave bouncing back and forth from the two interfaces. But you can also have wave guidance if you put four metallic walls on the waveguide, for instance. And if a wave has a metallic wall, if a waveguide has a metallic wall, the wave has to be totally reflected at the matter-air interface. Because as you have seen before, a uh, perfect electric conductor expels the electric field and the magnetic field energy cannot penetrate. So there will be total reflection. We usually don't call that total internal reflection, but just total reflection in the metal metallic interface. And the wave will bounce back and forth on the four interfaces as it propagates along. And the mathematics is difficult, more difficult. So we have to solve Maxwell's equations in its full glory inside the waveguide. So if you look at the TE modes, you can reduce the problem into solving a scalar wave equation. This is called a reduced wave equation. And this becomes a boundary value problem, a BVP, okay, a boundary value problem, which is the case when you have a partial differential equation with prescribed boundary condition on the boundary of the region in which you're solving your PDE. Okay, those problems are called BVP. Let me write it down over here. It doesn't write, let me see. Maybe I have to click here. Still doesn't write. Uh, let me see why. I don't know why it doesn't write, but let me not write them. Well, it refuses to write for me for some reason. I, I don't know why. But anyhow, these are called boundary value problems. And for TE modes, uh, which are modes having the electric field transverse to the Z axis, uh, it can be reduced into solving this scalar wave equation. For TM modes, likewise, you can have this reduced to solving uh, this partial differential equation with one difference. This scalar potential, which we call uh, pilot uh, potential, pilot scalar potential would satisfy a different boundary condition on the waveguide wall. That is called the Rickley boundary condition. And this is called the Neumann boundary condition. This thing here means normal derivatives. So having worked out the mathematics, um, then you can actually 
um, you can actually uh, try, uh, test drive your math for a rectangular waveguide. You can look for TE modes, and then it will have to satisfy the PDE that we have stipulated above here with the requisite uh, Neumann boundary condition on the waveguide wall. And with some hindsight, you know that this function will satisfy the reduced wave equation you have up there. Okay, you can easily show that it satisfies the reduced wave equation. And the reduced wave equation has the Laplacian, sorry, this should be Laplacian, okay. It's the transverse Laplacian. Okay, that would be your reduced wave equation. You can easily show that when you plug this back in, this equation is satisfied. This equation is satisfied. You can do it by plug and chuck very easily. Uh, you will find that your beta x is n pi over a, your beta y is n pi over b. However, since these are plane waves bouncing back and forth around the waveguide, uh, those plane waves have to satisfy the dispersion relations of a plane wave, which is that beta x plus beta y plus beta z is equal to omega square nu epsilon. Okay, that is beta square. And, and beta x and beta y are fixed by your boundary condition. They are fixed by being the eigenvalue of the problem or eigenfunction of the problem, okay? And this becomes your eigenvalue. Beta s square in this equation is actually your eigenvalue of the problem. And I hope you can appreciate that. And the eigenvalues are fixed. Okay, these eigenvalues only depends on the geometry, but not the materials inside the waveguide. However, beta depends on the materials that you have inside the waveguide because beta depends on mu and epsilon, and then you can solve for beta z from this, okay? And if you pick a particular n and a particular n that is called a TEMN mode. And if this eigenvalue that you have is larger than this number, beta z becomes pure imaginary. The wave is cut off. You cannot propagate down the waveguide when that happens, okay? And it turns out that the TE10 mode is the mode with the lowest cutoff. You can go through your mental exercise and convince you that that is the case, okay? And then um, you can also look at the group and the phase velocity of these modes. And the group velocity is zero near cutoff, but the phase velocity is infinitely large. And this is probably something you have heard of in, <clears throat> in your undergraduate course, when you have a wave coming at a shoreline. And if you look at the phase velocity of a wave coming in at the shoreline, okay, the phase difference is very, very large. So the phase velocity of those waves coming in at an oblique angle is very, very large because these are bouncing waves. The waves are bouncing at an oblique angle uh, of the waveguide wall and near cutoff near cutoff, these waves are actually bouncing like this. Okay, if I draw a side picture, uh, near cutoff, this wave are just bouncing back and forth like this without making any advancement in the Z direction. That is when it's near cutoff, okay? So the phase velocity is very, very high because if you were to be on the shoreline, and if you were to make this wave coming in, in uh, normally to the shoreline, uh, then you will see that the phase velocity is very high, but the group velocity is very low or zero because the mode cannot carry energy in the Z direction because it just bounces back and forth. And then with all this knowledge that you have, you can actually solve for the full electromagnetic field inside the waveguide using this uh, pilot scalar potential approach, and you can have a diligent student, a gifted one, uh, write computer codes that can actually plot all these field plots for you, okay? And then we move on to circular waveguide. The math is very similar, except that 
the boundary conditions would be different. The boundary condition would require you to take a normal derivative in the radial direction and then to impose the boundary condition that at rho equals a, the potential is equal to zero. Okay. So you will solve for this, uh, this uh, scalar potential, which we call pilot uh, scalar potential. For Tn, it will be this scalar potential. And for Te, it will be this scalar potential. And they are very similar to each other in terms of the PDEs, but they have one big difference, okay? They, they have one big difference between this scalar potential. Uh, to make sure that you are still with me, uh, what is the difference between these two scalar potential? What distinguishes them from each other? Can somebody tell me? Anybody tells me what is the difference between these two scalar potentials inside a hollow wave guide? Nobody knows the answer. Anybody wants to volunteer? What about Jun Chai? Would you know the answer for distinguishing these two scalar potentials? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know. You don't know. Okay, what about Michael Williams? Michael Williams, would you know what distinguishes? Um, well, you use different boundary conditions when you find excellent. each one. Okay, excellent. They will have different boundary conditions. You solve the same partial differential equation, but impose different boundary conditions for them. So if you go back a few slides, that is what we say in the beginning, okay? Uh, that over here, uh, you have the same PDE for both of them, but different boundary conditions are imposed on the waveguide wall for TE is this Neumann boundary condition for TM is the directly boundary condition. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. So, so the mathematics is hairy, but the concepts are simple. Okay, so you have to solve this uh, cylindrical waveguide and cylindrical coordinate, and you get Bessel functions instead of sines and cosines. There's the only difference, okay? You can solve these Bessel functions. Uh, they are solutions to this uh, Bessel's equation. And if you look for the solutions, uh, they are Bessel functions of the nth order, okay? And then they have uh, Neumann boundary condition on the waveguide wall, and then, uh, and then you can actually plot those Bessel functions. They have been known since the 1700s or the 1800s. So they are great mathematicians before us and they work out ways of computing those functions without having the need for a computer. They are expressed in terms of power series or Taylor series, okay? And then, uh, And then you can look for the cutoff and cutoff frequencies can be found by looking at the roots of the Bessel functions. And then they have very similar physics to that of a rectangular wave guide. And then you can do the same uh, for getting the field plots. Okay, you can find the total field inside the wave guide. Uh, so I think you have been asked to find the total field inside the wave guide in one of the homework problems. So you should be able to find those field quantities, X, Y, and Z component. Uh, but do, doing this plot is a challenge, okay? It's not easy to do, but some students can do that. This is done by Andy Greenwood when he was teaching this course at the University of Illinois. So a hollow waveguide can be put aside now because hollow waveguide is an idealization. Nothing is hollow and making hollow wave kite is a mathematician's dream. However, understanding the math and the physics of a hollow wave guide can give us physical insight into doing better engineering design. For instance, if you look at coaxial cable, it is a hollow wave guide, 
And you can solve for the solutions in closed form. You can find that the wave is TEM. And you also get the insight that the wave propagates because of the capacitance and the inductance you have in the geometry. In terms of engineering, a waveguide is a lot easier to find the method that is easiest, or waveguide that are easiest to fabricate. So a microstrip line is such a waveguide. A coplanar waveguide is also very easy to fabricate. In this case, you put the dielectric substrate on top of a metal plane, and then you etch a signal line on top of the dielectric substrate. And these two conductors resemble the inner and the outer conductor of a coaxial cable, and it can be used to guide the wave. Similarly, here you can have a signal line which is positive in sign, and another one is negative in sign, and together they can make something that resembles the transmission line. You don't need the ground plane. You just need a dielectric substrate to support these two metal pieces, and you can make a coplanar waveguide that way. Now, optical fiber is very, very important because it essentially uh, rev uh, revolutionizes modern day uh, communication technology because with optical light or optical beam, uh, you can have tremendous bandwidth. You can have tremendous bandwidth for the optical signal because if you want to carry a signal, you cannot carry the signal with a CW signal. So what you do is actually to convert this into envelope function. Okay, so you have to carry ones and zero. You might have one and zero, or one here. You have to uh, carry ones and zeros uh, using uh, modulation of the optical signal. Okay, when you modulate a signal, it is not purely monochromatic anymore. So if you have a monochromatic signal, if you look at this bandwidth, it is right at the frequency of operation of your monochromatic signal. But if you have a modulated signal, then the bandwidth is not zero. The bandwidth is like that, and that might be the carrier frequency, but you need a bandwidth in order to carry this signal. Okay, The bandwidth is because you don't have a pure monochromatic signal anymore. So if you have a waveguide that can have a very high frequency carrier, which is that case for optical fiber, you can carry huge bandwidth. If this is translated into optical frequency, this bandwidth can be gigahertz. Okay, even though this uh, optical signal may be a thousand terahertz or something. So it is very easy to carry huge amount of information using uh, optical signals, okay? Then we also proved by contradiction that if you have geometries like this, okay, you have a geometry like this, then you cannot have a TEM wave because by face matching, that would not be possible because a TEM wave has to be such that this beta Z is a beta of the medium, okay? So if this TEM wave is propagating in region zero, then it has to have a phase velocity or a wave of this nature. And if it's prop, uh, propagating in region one, it has to have a phase velocity of this nature. And phase matching is not possible anymore. So a pure TEM wave can exist in these structures. They have to be quasi-TEM, okay? And then uh, we talk about hybrid modes where you don't have pure TE nor pure TM and then it will be coupling of different modes. And then we talked about homomorphism. So even though a waveguide problem is very complicated, you can actually map it into a transmission line problem. We love transmission line problems because most engineers can handle transmission line theory. The theory is simple. You can solve problems with Smith charts. And so if you can map the waveguide problem into 
the transmission line problem, which we try to do here. Uh, you can solve this problem of wave bouncing back and forth in this conflict structure by finding the transmission line equivalence of this structure. Okay. I, I think I'll stop here because I have two minutes left and I let you ask whatever questions that you may like to ask. Does anybody have any questions? So you, you feel good about the course then? Okay. I hope you feel good about the course. Since you don't have questions, so everything is understandable by that definition. If you don't have any questions for the course, you have understood most things. What about Jun? Uh, do you have any questions, Jun? No. No, no questions? No. What about David? No, I'm all good. You're good? Okay. What about Jane? You have any question? Jane, you don't have any question? Jane Wong? I think I should uh, review the video later. Okay, very good. If, if you're new to these materials, uh, it's good to review the videos. What about Jason? You have any questions? Not right now, I don't okay. uh, I think it, yeah. Maybe. Okay, yeah, bring lots of questions uh, to the class or to the lecture so that we can uh, liven up the, the course, okay? How about Chang Q? Would you have any questions? Oh, I'm, all, I'm all good. Yeah, all good. Zheng Liu, you, you have any questions, Zheng Liu? Okay, then uh, I let you go. Then, if you don't have any question, I'll send out a take-home exam this afternoon. I'll make it due Monday at midnight because some students who are taking this course is actually online. They are also working uh, in with the company or, or whatever organizations they are with. So I think Monday midnight will give them more time to finish the take-home exam. Okay. I'll let you go then, if everything is okay with you. Keep safe, because the Thank COVID you. is not over yet. We still have a danger of uh, con contacting the disease. Okay, I'll let you go and take good care.